are back with Lieutenant Governor uh, Josh Tenorio, of course, Sabrina Salas, uh, Matt Tenorio. Well, first of all, um, LT, congratulations. Thank you so much. And, uh, you know, I'm pretty sure it's uh, been a wild ride for you. Can you tell us a little bit about the work you've been doing in the transition? Well, we've been working hard uh, interviewing cabinet members, putting our offices together, um, really understanding where we are in the government. So by now, we've already received uh, briefings from our transition committees. Uh, we'll get the full reports after the 11th uh, and uh, pretty optimistic that we can do a lot of good stuff. Uh, you know, I mean, I'm one of those technocrats, so I always look at these kinds of things and um, very optimistic with what we can be doing. Mm -hmm. You know, previous lieutenant governors, they've uh, focused on island-wide beautification, securing uh, federal grants. What will your role be? Well, you know, those are statutory responsibilities, mm -hmm. so for sure I'll be, uh, I'll be revamping some of those things. So for my reset for uh, federal funds, you know, I said at that debate that there was over $40 million, $49 million that was um, returned. So the way I envisioned the clearinghouse is really like an intervention team. I'll have accounting people there, I'll have program people, I'll have procurement people there, people that can see in advance uh, what agencies are maybe underperforming uh, and try and get in there and try and push it up. So some people have said, ah, you need to go out and bring the money, but I think that we need to spend the money that we're getting. Right. So that's my refresh for clearing house. And for beautification, I think it's going to be uh, working front line with the mayors. We're moving them back to Adaloupe after 16 years. Uh, you know, there's some funds and resources out there that I'd like to you know, get out and I tell you when I've been canvassing, especially up here up north in the Chamorro Lantris areas, there's a lot of cleaning up to do. And if we're gonna have, uh, if we're gonna have our young people feel good about the place that we live in, we better clean it up to, so they can be proud of it. So, right. uh, but on the other side, you know, I came from the court. I've always been leading both here and nationally, a lot of criminal justice reform efforts. So I'll be focusing a lot on um, working a lot with the team that we have in place I'm very excited about it. I think we have a high performing team, right. um, both up there and in DYA uh, that will be announced shortly and um, changing the way that we're handling people, looking at people for people and not treating them as numbers, trying to get some uh, effective programming in there so we can drop the crime and drop recidivism. I'll be spending a lot of time in those areas. And then of course, I've been helping the governor push um, and uh, helping her sort out the administration, so I'll be using my office to help her lead the government. So I'm I'm happy. Sounds like you got a full plate. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. You know, uh, something that was uh, I think it received a lot of attention in the national media is uh, you being the first openly gay uh, lieutenant governor of uh, Guam. How does that uh, affect what you do, and and does it? Well, you know, um, so I'm the first uh, openly gay lieutenant governor in the country. Oh, nice. uh, and uh, the first openly gay governor, Jared Polis from Colorado, I had dinner with him and he told me, by the way, you're the first one. That, <laughs> so I didn't realize right. that. So um, I think what I'm going to do is I am getting quite a lot of national and international attention for that. And uh, my view is that I'll use that to try and push the agenda of Guam. Nice. Uh, and that's what I think that um, I've talked to people about. Uh, and for me locally here, I think maybe I've been thinking about, uh, of course, it's always good to have role models, but I think really in this community, how complex it is. So for parents and um, relatives, people that might not really understand or uh, sometimes they're a little worried uh, that their children may be um, coming out as LGBT. I want to show them that your kid can aspire to do a lot, stand behind them, be proud of them. I think that's the best contribution I could give for our community. Nice, yeah. and I mean, we've always been a very uh, accepting community. So. Yeah, I bet, you know, right. not everybody. There's right. a lot of people that yeah. are not yeah. not uh, in that camp, and hopefully proving to them that it shouldn't matter what preference you are. Do the job, do your best, and yeah. There you go. Uh, let's talk about some of these uh, meetings that you've uh, attended off-island. Well, you know, I, I went to the National Lieutenant Governor's um, Conference, and uh, there was, there's was there been a shift. I think there were by nine um seats shifted from the other party to ours. Uh, and uh, a lot of people might, they always think I might be the youngest one and I'm not. <laughs> so I tell you the one surprising one is the youngest go lieutenant governor is 32 years old. Wow. 
He is a African-American gentleman from Wisconsin. Wow. And I could tell that he's going to be uh, something probably big in the future. I'm not even the second youngest or the third youngest. Even in Guam, I'm the fifth oldest of the lieutenant governors. Well, you're only like 38, 39, right, or something? <laughs> you know we're the same age, Chris <laughs> and Sabrina. I, I think we're the same. Are we, yeah, anyway, much. we'll discuss. We'll discuss. Fine discuss. wines, fine <laughs> wines. Right. You know, I, I wanted to ask because, you know, we've known each other a, a, a very long time. I know you've worked in, you know, all the branches of government. Is this, have you always aspired to run for public office? I mean, did I, you know I'm going to run for lieutenant governor? You know, I thought about it. Uh, mm -hmm. You know, I was a student leader and being involved in politics at a young right. age. And yeah. right out of the governor's office, I thought, yeah, I'm going to run. And in 2002, I ran for a week. I was like, yeah, I'm going to run when Rory and Tina and JQ mm -hmm. and every. And then I thought, I don't think I'm going to run. <laughs> and so I really thought that I took a turn because I my I really am good in policy work uh, in the technical side of things. Right. I'm good at politics too, but uh, you know I kind of like thrive in that area. So I thought I would always be better behind the scenes. So I really did not think that I would be running eventually until Lou talked to me back in 2016, and it started shaking my mind and um, doing this. Even when I when I came onto the scene, you know, mm -hmm. a lot of although a lot of the insiders might know me. I know you mentioned that, Chris. Right. A lot of people in the general public didn't know me. So right. kind of pe some people were angry. Like, who is this guy? He, you know, what? Uh, in fact, even at the great debate, you heard some of the heckling. Right. I heard some yeah. saying, "Shut up! You don't know what you're talking about." Uh, I'm thinking, oh "My gosh." Yeah. So just to me, I'm like, okay, well, I'm going to show you that I know what I'm and talking I think, about. I think that you were very effective in that. I mean, you know, Lou, everyone knows Lou, and uh, a lot of insiders did know you, but I think that was one of the, the things that you guys did very well in the campaign was getting the people, uh, you know, getting them to know Josh Tenorio. Yeah, yeah. An old person like me. <laughs> <laughs> so what was that conversation when you got the phone call from uh, the governor, or Lou? No, we met. Okay. So what happened was uh, she asked me to meet her for lunch. It was I'll never forget it was Mermaid. Mm -hmm. And uh, she was telling me that she was going to run or she was thinking about it. And I told her I thought it was a good idea. Right. Um, and then I told her, I said, you know, uh, um, I was committed to the other candidate at that time. Um, but really, I couldn't do anything. So I was telling her, you know, I'm kind of I'm not um, going to be able to come out because I'm at the court. And, uh, it, you know, I'm a little itchy because or it's already going to be the third cycle now where I've, I can't really express my opinions. My friends are mad at me because I'm not coming to their fundraisers, right. but you know, that's not my path. And slowly, we would meet every three weeks, and she slowly asked me, why don't you, would you consider running? You know, how long are you going to stay at the court? Um, and eventually got to a point where she asked me, and I was surprised. And so I thought, am I, first, am I going to do this? Um, and uh, I really decided... It was after the November elections when I saw the change and people wanted, it looked like people were open to different things and right. I decided, yeah, let's do it. So who, who did you um, seek advice from? Did you, did you go and talk to anybody about the decision? Absolutely. Um, you know, I remember, you know, you go back to people that you've campaigned with um, and I've been behind the scenes in the Guterres campaigns, right? Right. Mm -hmm. Uh, so I went back and I talked to some of the elders in the party. I remember uh, Don Weekly, who is uh, from Inarahan, who is a close friend, um, was one of the ones I talked to. Um, former Senator John Nuggan, who ended up becoming uh, one of our campaign chairs. Um, Francis Santos, BJ Cruz, who uh, I had worked for. Um, you know, I talked to them uh, and talked to my family. And a lot of... Uh, you know, I started talking about it with people at work, um, you know, that were, could tell that maybe something was up. And a lot of people were, you know, they, they felt that they, usually people jockey for a position and they said, you're being asked and how could you not accept this right. is an opportunity that I had not planned or had not schemed for. So, you yeah, know, that's kind of like in a, there's a lot of details over happy. <laughs> I guess when, this is the after parties. So. <laughs> when did it all sink in? Um, I guess it's been sinking in. Mm -hmm. um, you know, one of the moments, um, you know, there was, we were at church. Mm -hmm. So the week after the election, uh, there was a wedding for Ramon Underwood, right? Who was um, I'm very close to. And we were at church and I walked in and these kids were running up and they're like, hey, Josh. And this little girl's like, where's Lou at? <laughs> <There's> always, <laughs> she's coming. But, um, you know, during mass, 
uh, you know, after the homily and peace. And I said to Lou, I said, we said peace. I said, wow, we won the election. <laughs> <laughs> and, you know, the cool thing is I told her, I said, we won the election. We never even fought or argued. And that's been the nature, I guess, because wow. we have been uh, working together for a long time now. Um, it wasn't just out of convenience or out of political opportunity. We know each other pretty well. We respect each other's views. Uh, I have a good view about um, the role of the lieutenant governor, the the authority that the governor has, and I think it's based on a lot of mutual respect and trust. And I think um, that will prove to be a very good asset as we go in and govern this term. Nice. So let, let's uh, talk about um, some of the things that you're really excited to accomplish as lieutenant governor. Well, you know, I've been saying on the campaign trail that I really do think that the addiction epidemic on Guam is a big thing. For 28 years, I think it's been 29 this year, right. uh, an addiction to methamphetamine. And I don't think that the courts are the place to handle drug therapy. It is for violent offenders, and it, it's done tremendous work with the drug courts, but the partnership should come from the executive branch. It should be a reliable, evidence-based uh, drug treatment. People need to get back to work. There's a lot of families that are split. There's a lot of child welfare cases. So for me, I think building a robust um, evidence base, I like to say that because it's data driven, using things that work and applying it here to try and, and help bring, peop bring that problem down, I think is going to be a top priority for me. I mentioned the other areas that I'll work on, but really right now, I think that I can see the opportunity, the moving elements to have something that I think can really restore a lot of lives and kind of maybe try and sow this gap that's been in this community for so long. Right. It's causing underemployment. It's causing a lot of problems and a lot of talented people we know that have an addiction that can get back on top. That's what I would like to that's uh, if I could tell you the one top thing that I will be looking for our administration to win, it's going to be there. And uh, the team we have at Behavioral Health, um, Teresa Ariola from Sanctuary, who has built the, that system for the kids. Right. And Carissa Pangalinen, who's been working with in that department in different capacities, I think we'll be able to get it done. And with the nonprofit, this only works when you push resources out and you have the nonprofit sector and the faith based sector moving in. And that's where I think the we go on that issue. That's the top issue, I think. Right, really, there's touching to hear that. I mean, you know, we've, we've all got the family members. I mean, personally, Everybody. I've had family members. And um, it really just attacks the, the root of the problem, which is something we haven't uh, really seen looking at the rehabilitation. I tell you, you know where I saw it is um, juvenile drug court, right, and talking to the judges and the case managers. And so they're telling me, you know, we always track um, just the numbers. And they'll tell me, you know, some of the kids their parents are in drug court. They're so how can the kids be expected to succeed if the addiction is inside the home and they're seeing that? And you have to be able to, to turn it around. So it's real deep. This is a long-term thing, but there are little things that can be done to really make a lot of progress in a short period of time, but it's in for the long haul. Well, thank you so much, Josh. Congratulations yeah, thank again. You. Final comments? Oh, I just want to thank everybody for coming out. And uh, as the governor said, uh, for those of you who voted for us, thanks so much. And for those of you who didn't, we'll prove to you that we're worthy of your trust. Give us a chance and give us your support. And just to all the young people, the young, talented people that are here or even abroad, we need your talent. We ask you to come to Guam. Uh, or if you're Guam, rise up and take a stand and do something. There you go. Come back home. That's right. All right, so this has been a, a special edition uh, of the After Party. Remember, last Monday every month, uh, we're taking a look back at uh, all the hot stories uh, with some very, uh, very special guests uh, right here on these couches. So uh, on behalf of Lieutenant Governor uh, Josh Honoria, Sabrina Salas-Mattanani, thanks so much for watching. My name's Chris.